Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, January 24th, 2008. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, John Palmer joins us to talk about efficiency in the mash tun. How well do you get the good stuff out of your grain? And if you're not doing so well, how do you fix it? We'll also talk to John about his latest book. Well, if you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And we still have a few of the brewer's logbooks in stock, so check those out as well. We're getting a bunch of entries for the You Know You're a Home Brewer When contest. If you don't know about it, the folks who make brew haulers those handy strappy things that you can put on your carboy to make carrying it around safer and easier. They've donated some of their product to us, and we're going to give them away to you. We'll give away 10 brew haulers to those who can best finish the sentence, you know you're a home brewer when. Our 10 favorite entries will each receive a brew hauler. Uh, Steve Wilkes, Andy Sparks, and I will be the judges, and you need to get your entries in by noon Central Time on Sunday January 27th. I forgot to put a deadline on it last time. So noon Central Time, Sunday, January 27th. And uh, we may do the show next week with our winners. So good luck, good luck everybody, with that. And we appreciate the brew, ha- uh, the, uh, brew hauler, folks, if I can talk. Uh, let's jump quickly into the mailbag. Eric from Waconia, Minnesota writes, Recently I popped a disc in my back while lifting a full pot of hot sparge water. Eric says, I know I missed the deadline for your bad brew show. (laughs) He says, I finished the brew with the help of a neighbor, but was left with the question of how to brew while healing up. I took your small batch theory to heart and have brewed an all-grain two-gallon batch of California Common, which I can cart around if needed. Well, there's another happy small batch brewer. I hope that uh, Eric can get back up to speed soon. But in the meantime... Uh, brewing smaller batches is helping to keep him brewing good beer. So at least there's there's a silver lining to that cloud. David in Pinsaukin, New Jersey, writes with another small batch-related question. David says, My question comes from the episode with Chris Colby talking about using a two-gallon water cooler to mash a batch of grains. I was curious. If one wanted to try this method but only brew a small batch, or let's say half batch, Could one use this grain mashing technique, but then never add extra liquid extract or additional water? Would the amount of fermentables from the mashed grain be enough gravity for a half batch? David says, I would also half the amount of hops and other ingredients accordingly. I really want to get my hands wet with all grain brewing and thought this would be a good start. I was also hoping to brew smaller test batches and thought this would be a good way to brew more often without stockpiling cases of beer in my house. Well, sure, you can brew small batches of all grain beer using the two gallon cooler. I've done it a handful of times and it works pretty well. Uh, in fact, for our holiday video podcast episodes, I mashed four pounds of two row with a couple ounces of 60 Love Bond crystal uh, in my two gallon cooler to get a nice little barley wine. It came out after uh, all the, the, the transferring and all that. It was, it was a little over two quarts or a little over half a gallon uh, at a starting gravity of uh, 1088. It turned out to be a little over uh, 10% alcohol, I believe. It was a very nice little beer, and uh, we were able to play with it for the Christmas shows. So check those out. So uh, I don't know if you could provide all the fermentables uh, for a two-and-a-half gallon batch with a two-gallon cooler. Um, if you're making a session beer, you might, but for for one-gallon batches, there's certainly enough room in the two-gallon cooler. It's a great way to play with all-grain brewing if you've never done it before, and it's a lot quicker than working with a, a full five- or, or ten-gallon batch. And you can, do it, you can do it inside, which is a plus around here because it's pretty cold. Uh, Wake in Kamakura, Japan, wrote after hearing our Leftover Brew Day episode, It's the one where Andy and I sort of shot from the hip and came up with a a couple of recipes from scratch. Wake says, for a beginner brewer to do a leftover brew day without doing any kind of fancy IBU calculations, how likely is it to end up with a bad-tasting batch? It doesn't seem like a guy can go too wrong 
with a pound of extract per gallon, a pound or so of specialty ground, grains, an ounce or so of some sort of hops, and a pack of ale yeast. I guess it's possible, but how likely is it, assuming that you don't care about matching a certain style? Well, I think you have to think about brewing like cooking. If you make a spaghetti sauce and add too much garlic or oregano, then the sauce isn't going to come out well. However, if you've made spaghetti sauce for a while and you've, you've seen good recipes, you've used good recipes, and you have a feeling about how much garlic or spices are appropriate for the amount of, say, tomatoes that you have, then you can be more confident in making a good sauce. So in my, in my way of thinking, it's the same thing with brewing. Andy and I have kind of a feel of how much hops we can use at what alpha acids. And um, we also were not completely shooting from the hips as far as calculating IBUs. We use the formulas in Ray Daniels' uh, Designing Great Beers to kind of back up our assumptions and, and give us kind of a rough idea, a ballpark of, of where we were. And you can do the same with um, – there's lots of brewing software that's out there as well that you can use to help calculate your IBUs. But uh, probably the most important thing is to achieve the proper balance between the hops and the malt. If you're not trying to hit a certain style, it's less important that the balance be perfect. But if a beer is way too bitter or way too sweet, it's not going to be drinkable. So I'd advise that you look at some tested recipes for particular styles, use them as a guideline, and brew more often so that you get kind of a, a good feel of what the ingredients give to the beer. And you might find a beer that you enjoy that's not in the style guidelines. So sure, play around with your, your beer, play around with your ingredients, and, and have fun. Greg in Albuquerque, New Mexico, has this advice. Greg says, with all the talk and problems associated with the recent hop shortage, I thought I would write with some possible, possibly obvious tips. Greg says, for extract brewers, you could make your hops go farther by simply doing larger boils. It's easier to find bigger pots than some of these hops. And do late extract additions for those extract and partial mash brewers. Greg says, I've been able to reduce my bittering hop requirements by half an ounce and more on some recipes. It may be a pain, but it may help in the long run. Well, good points, Greg. If you do full volume boils, if you boil all your wort at once, rather than adding water in the fermenter, you'll get more bitterness from your hops because the wort will be less dense. And if you add most of your extract, Around 15 minutes before the end of the boil, you'll increase your utilization as well because, again, the, the wort is less dense. And you might also think about boiling your bittering hops for a bit longer than the 60 minutes as well. And maybe that way we'll get more use out of those precious hops. Well, now let's get into our interview with John Palmer, author of How to Brew. Uh, I received a plea for help from a listener recently with mash efficiency problems, and I enlisted John's help in solving the problem. Well, John Palmer, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you very much, James. It's good to be here. It's been a long time. We've missed you. Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, brewing life. <laughs> gotta gotta <laughs> trade them off some time to time, I guess. Well, you, you're a you're a popular guy. You've got other places to be. Uh, yeah. Uh, you among the things that you've been doing uh, is another book, you and Jamil. Yeah, we uh, just came out uh, a couple months ago with Brewing Classic Styles, and uh, it it really is a neat, a neat book. Um, he and I have been talking about it for about a year and uh, gotten together. Well, starting at GABF uh, over a year ago. Then talked about through the fall and uh, over the holidays, and then uh, pitched it to the Brewers Association, and they, and they liked the idea, so we went forward with it. And uh, I, I really, I think it's, I think it's just a great, you know, resource because um, you can you can compare styles in one volume. Um, my part in it was uh, smaller uh, than Jamil's, of course, but uh, I did, did try to give some pointers on how to scale down a recipe, um, how to brew uh, effectively with malt extract, and, you know, conserve, conserve your hops. And uh, I, I think it's a real good book, so I'm, I'm happy with it. 
And, and uh, Jamil Zainashev, I guess, for those who, who are not familiar with uh, Jamil, how many recipes did he submit in this uh, book? 82 or 84, something like that. Wow. Wow. That's And they, they're all award winners, right? That's right. Yeah. He, um, he uh, even has a couple recipes from friends that, uh, you know, beers that he had tasted or judged and um, just, you know, judge them as superior examples of the style or, you know, variations on the style, uh, you know, different from the uh, the recipe that he had put in the, you know, that he would submitted for the style. But, you know, here's a variation. Every bit is good. And uh, so it help, really helps illustrate the style well, I think. Well, excellent. I get emails every now and then from people asking for recipes for certain styles, and I think that would be an excellent place to start. Well, speaking of starting, let's let's start our, our chat on uh, on efficiency. And the question that uh, that started all this was uh, from Jameson in Boone, North Carolina. Uh, Jameson says, uh, "Could you please do a show on all grain efficiency? How you calculate it? The difference between brew house efficiency and mash efficiency? Uh, easy things you can do to improve one's efficiency, and most of all, what is generally considered a good efficiency?" What could one realistically expect from different systems, say a false bottom, manifold, and stainless steel braid system? And is it really possible to get these high efficiencies people boast about online, these 85 to 95 percent efficiencies? He says he's fairly new to all grain and have done five or six batches, and no matter what he does, can't seem to improve his efficiency above 55 percent. So he's got efficiency. He's got mash ton envy, John. I guess. <laughs> uh, I guess we should start uh, it, at the beginning. What what is efficiency when we're talking about the mash? Okay, well, efficiency is it's a percentage. It's comparing what you're getting from your process compared to what the theoretical number is, or in, which actually is a laboratory number. And uh, there, there are two types of efficiency. There's mash efficiency, and then there's laudering efficiency, and then there's the, the total, the combined efficiency of the two different processes. Um, so, so it's, it's, it's how it's, efficient we can extract those fermentables out of the grain, right, essentially? That's right. You know, how much did you get out compared to the laboratory uh, measurement? And how do they how do they do it in the lab? What they do in the lab is they they grind up the malt into a flour practically, and then they mash it uh, through a multi rest mash over uh, more more than an hour, and uh, then take that and lauder it through a coffee filter, you know, in essence, a paper coffee filter, uh, for a very long time, and you know. And allow that to completely drain, and then measure the weight of that uh, extract, that you know, liquid, uh, with its density, and determine what their percent uh, extraction was from the, you know, the, the. They also weigh the malt afterwards, and uh, it, it's a weight percent of weight extracted from the malt. So that number is is considered the 100% benchmark that we're looking for. But we can't get that, can we? No, it's very difficult to get that. And that number is, uh, you'll see that on malt analysis sheets. That is, in its, uh, you'll see it listed as percent extract, fine grind, dry basis. So they've taken a sample of malt, ground it up into powder. Um, they also take a similar sample, same weight, uh, they thoroughly dry it in an oven and then compare the weights and calculate the percent moisture that was in that malt sample. And then they adjust the uh, the soluble extract that they extract from the malt sample uh, based on the amount of moisture that was present and to take that out of the equation. So you've got a percent extract, fine grind, dry basis. So that you, that's And that's a number you can compare – Maltster to maltster, year to year, because it's been uh, you, you've taken out the moisture factor, and that number is typically eighty percent by weight uh, for most uh, you know two row malts, 
two row base malts. Hmm. Uh, your specialty malts, your kilned malts, say like a Munich or Vienna or going into your caramel or your roasted malts like chocolate, uh, the percent extract fine grind dry basis uh, falls to say like uh, 70% or se- um, or 75% by weight. And that's because of the, the cooking process or the kilning process or the roasting process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that and a lot of uh, a lot of your specialty malts will be made from uh, six row barley, so you'll have a higher percentage of husk weight in that sample, and that'll account for a couple percent. Uh, you'll still you'll have less less carbohydrate mass in your weight sample uh, with a six row malt than you will with a two row malt. And so that, and since a lot of specialty malts are made from six or at least in, especially in the United States, um, your your extract fine grain dry basis for these specialty malts will be a little bit lower. Now, what is the the typical um, uh, efficiency number that a home brewer can expect? I mean, are these uh, you know, as, as Jameson asks, are these eighty five to ninety five percent efficiencies realistic? Yeah, they are. But let's let's define. Let's point out the difference here. Okay. When when we homebrewers talk about efficiency, we're comparing how much soluble extract we got compared uh, or in terms of that 80% uh, fine grind dry basis. Uh, that's a, that represents 100%. If you got – if you, you know, mashed five pounds of malt or let's make it easy, 10 pounds of malt <laughs> and you got – Eight pounds of soluble extract out of that, then you would have gotten 100% efficiency mm. because you're getting the laboratory value. So they, they are their measurement is 100%. That's our 100% goal. Right. Yeah. And uh, when you if you convert that to a uh, typical homebrewer's measurement of gravity points per pound per gallon, what you do is you take that 80% fine grind dry basis number, multiply it by uh, the conversion uh, factor um, standard for sucrose. Uh, sucrose, or table sugar, gives up 100% of its weight as soluble extract, and it raises hydrometer reading by 46 points per pound when you dissolve one pound of sugar to make one gallon of solution. That one gallon of solution will have a uh, hydrometer reading of 1046. Mm-hmm. So you pr- you multiply 80% times 46 points per pound per gallon, and you get 37. Yeah, I think it's 37 ppg. And uh, so 37 ppg represents 100% uh, extract. And so when you do your mash and your lauder and you collect your runnings and take their gravity and measure their volume uh, and you determine that you have collected say 30 points per pound per gallon versus a maximum of 37 well that works out to about uh, I think it's 80-85% efficiency so one one pound of say two row uh, mashed in uh, for one gallon of wort uh, would yield around 1030 uh, specific yeah. gravity. That's right. And so what we're saying is in terms of typical of efficiency, what is a good efficiency? I'd say I'd say 75%, you know, good is a good average. I think that if you're getting 75% out of your process, you're doing fine. Absolutely nothing to worry about. If you're getting 65% I think that's still adequate, um, and there's there may be things that you can do to improve that. Uh, maybe look at wart loss, you know, in your in your mash ton or your lauder ton. Um, maybe look to your your mashing schedule or your your grind uh, to bring it bring it up. And I think you you should be able to bring it up um, without too much trouble. When you get down to the 55%, and now here this is 55% of 
37 ppg so you're you're talking um, maybe 18 you know or, or 19 or 20 points per pound per gallon yield that you're getting that's when you have to say okay well, I'm I'm missing something here hmm. um, I think there it could be uh, the grind that you're using uh, very often your thermometer that you're using to gauge your mash temperature may be off or you may be getting significant uh, wort loss in your system and we can talk about that some more too um, but you know let's there's there's overall overall brew house efficiency there's mash efficiency and there's laudering efficiency and uh, at in terms of first cut um, I always think about mash efficiency, and the way that you measure that is you you look at the gravity of the wort that you that you're getting in your mash ton. Uh, batch sparging is a, is a good way to measure that. You just if you're able to completely drain the wort from your mash ton. Uh, and measure that gravity that you, you've got your uh, your OG uh, times your volume. That'll give you your total gravity points. So let's let's call this uh, five gallons times a uh, 1070 gravity. That works out to uh, 350 points. And if you used um, let's say you used 10 pounds of malt to make that. Uh, that works out to you know 35 ppg. Well, 35 compared to 37, that's pretty high. That's like you know 92 or percent or so. Mm-hmm. So if you're following me there, now we now we need to add in uh, laudering efficiency. Um, let's say you use a um, a cooler with a false bottom in it, and when you're done laudering, you still have uh, a gallon of wort uh, in the false, you know, in them in your lauder ton that your pickup tube couldn't pick up. Mm-hmm. In the dead well, space there. Yeah, that dead space. So you know, there there's a gallon of runnings. Um, let's say that you know that's as a, a 1040 gravity. Well. You know that's forty points that didn't that is subtracted from that three hundred and fifty total points that you were looking to extract, and uh, that that can drop your your perceived efficiency, you know, your your brew house efficiency down uh, significantly, and that comes from watering efficiency. You know, are you are you able to extract everything that you made in the mash? So to kind of back up and and go over. Uh, a, a point that you made to kind of get an expectation of what you're shooting for. Say if you have a, you know, if you have a mash of 10 pounds of say two row, mm-hmm. you multiply 10 times the 35 gravity points because you're going to have you're shooting for a, gra- a gravity of 1035, right? Yeah. So we would have uh, 10 or 37 rather because that's the the oh, benchmark well, yes. that we're shooting for. Right. So right. we would have 370 that is the – in the lab, if they get 100 percent – or if they get their uh, – if they reach their benchmark, they're going to get a uh, gravity of, of a 1030 – or they're going to get 370 gravity points. points. Right. Uh, I hope I'm and not then losing divide. more. But, uh, right. And then you get your, your wort, and so you have five gallons – at help me out. Okay. And now so, I've lost okay. myself, John. I can <laughs> this is why okay. you're here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm trying to do two on myself. But yeah, <laughs> if you've got let's say you've got ten pounds of malt and you're gonna mash that and collect a volume of work from it. Uh, theoretically you can get you know if you if you did it, if you ground it up into powder and lauder and mashed and laudered it really slowly and collected every single drop of wort uh, like they do in the lab, you would extract um, 37 points per pound per gallon, that which is 80% uh, by weight soluble extract. 
and that represents 370 gal, uh, 370 gravity points. Now, that is that's your total you know, mass. That's a total weight of soluble extract. Now you got to divide that by the volume it's in. So as as I get out my my calculator here, so if you have 370 points divided by mm-hmm. five, say you got five gallons of wort. Right. If you hit 1074 as your specific gravity for those first runnings, you would be at 100 percent efficiency. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you you take that total points, you divide it by the volume. That should be, or that is, the gravity that you will measure with your hydrometer. And let's, to make it more practical, let's spin that around. I've mashed 10 pounds of grain. I collect 5 gallons of 1060 wort. Well, uh, 5 times 60 is 300. And if looking at, you know, the theoretical of 370, what, uh, punch out on a calculator there, what's 300 divided by 370? 300 divided by 370 equals 0. 0.81, so 81%. That 81%. So you've got a, you got a, a mash or an, an efficiency there of 81%. So that's 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 how to that's how to measure what you're expecting, and then to measure what you get. Now, there are also <clears throat> if you've got um, specialty grains in there, those are different from the uh, theoretical ten thirty seven or the thirty seven gravity points. Right, right. And uh, this is where you know a spreadsheet or brewing software like ProMash comes in handy, or Strange yeah. Brew, or one of the other ones. <laughs> Beer tools, yeah, where you can you can get the 100 percent value, or the, in other words, the extract fine grind dry basis percentage for each of these malts, and then add up the theoretical contribution that each specialty malt could make. Now, very often, especially in the lighter styles, you're only adding you know five percent of these other. Uh, Especially malts, you know, in terms of the total weight, you know, maybe uh, two pounds out of ten, or what has twenty percent. But you know, you're adding a small percentage, and the difference in their total soluble extract versus the base malt uh, is not too much. Okay. So you can just kind of arm wave and say, okay, I'm expecting, you know, thirty-seven or maybe thirty-five ppg from, you know, theoretically from my from my grain bill. And and then measure how much wort you collect, and uh, and its gravity, and figure out your total points. Compare that to um, the tab, you know, the total pounds times you know your your theoretical number that you're using, and come out. Um, you can either arm wave and say it's all 37 or 36, um, or you can add them up individually. But uh, it'll you'll still be ballpark. Now to kind of get back on track, uh, you were saying that if you're if you're at seventy five percent efficiency, you're doing you're doing pretty good. And if you want to yeah. bump up your gravity a little bit, you can add a little bit more uh, more grain going into your mash. If you kind of know what your brew house efficiency is, uh, you can kind of compensate uh, for that by adding you know additional grain. But if you're down to where Jameson says he is at fifty five percent you've got some issues that you need to take care of. So what what are the factors that you would advise Jameson to start looking at? Okay, the, the first place I think to look is uh, wart loss. You know, in looking at, looking at your lauder ton because um, mash, mashes are pretty efficient. I mean, they happen. It, it's hard to screw up the mash unless your temperature your temperature is way off. So... You're probably converting all the sugars. You're probably getting all the sugars in solution, but you may be leaving them behind in the mash tun, in the, or in, either in the mash tun or the lauder tun if you're transferring, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, look at your your sparging system, or your, whether it's a false bottom, a manifold, or a bazooka screen, or a, you know, or a braided hose. Um, 
look and see if you're leaving any liquid behind in the water ton because uh, all of that is potential extract that uh, goes into this efficiency calculation. Uh, if, if you're satisfied that you're not leaving a large amount behind, um, and when I, you know, and if you're getting 75%, yeah, you're probably leaving, you know, a couple quarts of work behind in your, in your lotter ton. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, the, the grain itself is going to retain, um, what is it, about a half a quart per pound or roughly a liter per kilogram. Yeah, I think I've told people to, uh, to figure you're losing about a, a tenth of a gallon per pound. I don't know how that. <laughs> whatever, whatever system that you use. Yeah, to, yeah. To but you're gonna exactly. You're gonna have retained uh, moisture in the malt. I mean, in the mash. So mm-hmm. there are little little sponges there. Right. Um, but you know, if you so if 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 you're leaving that behind, fine. That's that's taken. That's a given. Uh, but make sure you don't have any free liquid that you're just not getting out of the water ton. Now, uh-huh. how, how important is the mill of the grain for efficiency? the the way The way the milling works is it drives the speed of the mash of conversion. So, uh, you'll people may see on forums um, probers talking about, "Hey, the mash occurs in twenty minutes," or and so, you know, if you're mashing longer than 20 minutes, you're wasting your time. Mm. Well, you got to take into account uh, particle size. How accessible are the carbohydrates to the enzymes? Um, in a very finely ground mash, uh, you know, it's going to be a pain in the ass to lauder, but mm. you will get very good conversion because you've got great access to the enzymes to all the to the to all the starches. In a coarse grind, um, uh, you know, if it's like, um, oh, and I, I let me let me go off on a side note here. Uh, the extract fine grind dry basis and extract coarse dry, coarse grind dry basis that you'll see on malt analysis sheets, those are still flour compared to uh, homebrew mills. Ah. Okay, uh, there. It, even the coarse grind is ground pretty darn finely. It's a. It's basically a multi-pass grind that you would do. Like if you ran your malt through your malt mill twice, maybe even three times, that would be very similar to a coarse grind hmm. in the laboratory. Um, a lot of home brewers, when you run your malt through your mill once, you'll get a grind that's pretty comparable to. Oh, percolator grind of coffee, you know, in the coffee can, or Maxwell House, something like that. It's it's fairly coarse, mm-hmm. um, and that's a good thing because it allows you to lauder easily. Uh, you're not going to get a stuck mash, stuck sparge, but it's going to take, you know, better than half an hour in some cases uh, to get the enzyme to fully penetrate those those large particles and convert the starches to sugars. So patience is a factor in mash efficiency. Yeah. So uh, if, you've, if you're grinding pretty coarse and you're not mashing long enough or hot enough or you know, other factors, and then you, you sparge, well, you may be leaving behind some unconverted starch due to uh, the, coarsen- the coarseness of your grind. If you grind very fine, uh, the mash will convert quicker. Um, but if you if you take if you let the coarse grind sit long enough in the mash ton, and I'll just I'll throw out a number of an hour and a half, just to, just for you know let's say it's really complete, you will get uh, very good efficiency. You will get all of that uh, carbohydrate converted. And now if you take care in laudering it, you will get, you know, pretty near the theoretical number for that grain. Uh, it's all a matter of giving the processes enough time to happen. Um, so if you don't grind, if you don't grind uh, small enough uh, and you rush through the mash and rush to your lauder, 
uh, that can be a source of uh, efficiency loss. Okay. Now, in that across? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think so. Okay. Uh, I hope I didn't spin it around. <laughs> in in the uh, in the January February issue of uh, Brew Your Own magazine, you wrote uh, an article uh, on what I think we're moving on into next, and that is uh, to get the most efficient loudering. Um, right. So uh, compare, uh, say you you've got your your batch spargers and you've got your fly spargers. Is there that much difference between the two practices? Um. No, if, if given enough time, um, let's let's step back and say, and then talk about our mash. You know, let's get it. Let's uh, standardize this mash that we've made. Um, one of the one of the other factors on a mash efficiency that we didn't touch on, but is important, is uh, is your thermometer calibrated? Hmm. If your thermometer isn't calibrated, you may not be mashing uh, hot enough. To get a full, um, what we call solubilization, or you know, um, you don't get the uh, all the starches soluble in the wort, and then the the enzymes can't uh, can't convert them. Uh, so you've got to you've you got to make sure that your thermometer is correct. Um, if you're mashing for high fermentability. Uh, Lower temperatures take longer to convert than higher temperatures. So if you're doing, you know, if your if your mash temperature is down in the, uh, excuse me, 150 degrees Fahrenheit uh, range, where you're trying to get really high fermentability by, you know, um, ac- accentuating the beta glucanase, and that'd be around 65 right. degrees Sorry. Celsius. Uh, yeah, beta amylase. I meant to say not glucanase. Uh, if you're trying to, you know, working on the beta. Uh, the beta amylase uh, conversion at that low temperature is going to take longer than say conversion at 158 degrees or 67 and a half 68 degrees Celsius. So that's that's another time factor in terms of you know let's but let's assume that we've done our mash we have we've a, we've done a good efficient mash we've got our wort ready to to be drawn off. And now we have three choices in terms of, of uh, lauder tons. We can have a false bottom. We can have a copper tube manifold, or we could have like a bazooka screen or a single, you know, single steel braid uh, collection device. Um, and we have a couple of met choices in terms of the laudering technique that we use. We can do fly sparging, or continuous sparging. We can do batch sparging. Or we could do no sparge. Now, because the grain is retaining liquid, retaining wort, uh, a no sparge is inefficient. You know, you leave behind a substantial portion of sugars if you don't sparge. If you just drain off that first runnings, you know, you'll collect uh, a fairly high gravity uh, wort. And in that article, in I'll brew your own, I have a table that uh, talks about what your uh, gravity should be. If you have uh, a, or a grist to, or a liquor to grist ratio of like a, a one and a half quarts per pound or uh, three liters per kilogram, um, you should you should measure about a 1075 specific gravity for that first runnings. Mm-hmm. And that's just that's just simple uh, you know, Physics, or you know, um, in terms of sol- the eighty percent soluble extract and so on that the grain has. And if and, and if you're and if you're making a big beer, uh, mm-hmm. and you're you're wanting not to boil for a long time, maybe that's that's a strategy. But as you said, it's it's not very efficient. That's right. So what you would go then is to say, okay, I've drained off that first runnings. It's four gallons at ten seventy five, let's say, and uh, now I. I I'm going to add some more hot water to the to the lauder ton, and I'm going to extract more sugar that's been retained in the grain, and that's your second runnings, and uh, it's ba- that's batch sparging where you add back uh, 
water to the mash tun, re-wet it, you know, stir it, let it settle, recirculate, or Vorloff, and uh, and collect your second runnings. Batch sparging is most efficient when your initial runnings and your second runnings are the same volume. Hmm. And uh, it's it's pretty easy to get um, seventy five to seventy five percent efficiency, uh, even eighty percent efficiency using that. Um, the last method, uh, continuous sparging, tends to be a little more efficient, uh, but you have to go slow. And you can get uh, with batch, you can get anywhere from you know seventy five to eighty five. With continuous sparging or fly sparging, you can get uh, 85 to 95 percent, depending on the rate that you go. And here is where your laudering device makes a big difference, mm. because continuous sparging is a rinsing process, uh, whereas uh, batch sparging is um, it's more of a leaching process. You put the water in, you let the the sugars in the grain diffuse uh, out into the liquid. And you know that that concentrated concentration gradient drops, and it's it stops. You know it, those sugars diffuse out, and then you just drain it off. Uh, but in continuous sparging, you're rinsing, so you want to equally rinse all areas of that grain bed. And a false bottom is the most efficient way to do that, because you're collecting uh, from all. Uh, all areas underneath the mash, and, and, and hopefully you're not getting channeling. You're not getting uh, the water kind of finding the path of least resistance through, say, a you know an empty spot in the uh, yeah in the, in the like grain. where you just pulled your mash paddle out. You yeah. know, there's a nice little <laughs> loose channel there, um, or running down the sides of the of the mash tun towards the drain. That's another uh, laminar flow or easy flow section for the for the wort to go. Um, so yeah, you want to, if you're going to continue to sparge, you got to draw off slowly and make sure that you set up a steady state flow condition that's uniform throughout that grain bed. Uh, then that will make sure that all areas of the grain bed are equally well, equally well rinsed and, uh, you'll get, you'll get your best efficiency that way. And you have, uh, uh, illustrations in the article, Showing the the kind of flow of wort through the grain bed when you have one collection point, which would be like a you know like a hose braid, as opposed right. to two collection points or multiple collection points, which would be more of a of a manifold that looks right. kind of like a ladder. Um, and then, uh, so so you're saying that more the more places that the wort has to drain away from the grain. Uh, the better for the efficiency of the continuous or fly sparge. That's right. Yeah, a, a multi-pipe manifold, uh, say like four pipes, um, you know, and in a what I call a balanced configuration, um, such a, that will be um, as a, nearly as efficient as a false bottom in many cases. Um, the, the false bottom is always going to be slightly more efficient, but uh, you can approach a difference that is 95 versus 98% efficient in terms of uh, uniformity of flow and uniformity of rinsing of all the grain in the cooler. Mm. But again, it takes so, patience. It does. You, if you do it too fast, that's when you set up your channeling and you can you know end up bypassing all the grain as the the wort, you know, try, just hurries to the drain. So, so we to kind of go over uh, our, our keys to efficiency so far: uh, the proper temperature, the proper time, uh, the proper mm -hmm. mill, uh, right. the proper collection device for the method of sparging and, and loudering uh, that you're you're going to choose. Are, That's right. Are those pretty much the high points? Those are the high points, yeah. Uh, the if you're going to be, you know, if you're going to strive for the highest efficiency, ninety percent, then you really want to uh, use a false bottom and uh, make sure that your pickup tube is going to collect every single ounce of wort that uh, your lauder ton generates. 
uh, and you're going to want to use a very slow flow so that uh, you don't have any channeling to worry about. Uh, that's going to be the most. That's going to extract the greatest percentage of uh, soluble extract from that mash. Um, if you're gonna, if you're not going to be quite that worried about it, and you're going to be happy with 75% or uh, efficiency, then batch sparging is is a more robust technique because now you can use a single hose braid or a manifold, and uh, because you're simply mixing the uh, water and the and the and the grain and letting it come to equilibrium draining all of the water off and then reflooding it and letting it diffuse again and draining it all off uh, you know you could you could just stick a uh, a hose with a uh, a paper towel wrapped over the end of it, you know, just to <laughs> keep from sucking up grain. You know, it, it, it's it's simply a draining process at that point. So your collection, you know, the way you collect the word, whether it's steel braid or a, a slotted pipe manifold, is up to you, and it's up to your convenience. So, John, I have to ask, what what do you, what methods do you use, and <laughs> what is your brew house efficiency? Ah, uh, well. To be to be completely frank, I have been all over the map uh, because <laughs> I'm, you know, in, in writing my books and articles and so on, I've I've done most every method under the sun just so I can, you know, have that hands-on experience to be able to write about it. Um, I guess my preferred uh, method over the last, you know, several years is uh, a slotted manifold a multi you know like four pipe slotted manifold uh in a uh you know like a round beverage cooler copper yeah yeah um it was just an easy way you just use a standard hacksaw cut a slot you know halfway through the pipe about half an inch apart from each other along the whole length of the pipe and uh that works great whether you, and it, that system works well whether you're fly sparging or batch sparging or no sparging, um, the the distribution doesn't matter mu- much when you're batch sparging. But uh, on the other hand, it, you have having more collection points assures that uh, the manifold isn't going to clog up and stick, mm-hmm. you know, and get get end up with a stuck sparge. And that's no fun at all. So yeah. So so what's your number? Oh, uh, when I using that method, I was usually around eighty-five or ninety percent. Wow! And continuous sparging. Yeah, yeah. Um, going to batch sparging, I think it was I hung out right around eighty. Um, yeah, because I tended to hurry, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I was I was usually around at least eighty percent. I always figured my recipes based on eighty percent. Um, and sometimes they sometimes they come out high. Uh, last boy, the last batch I brewed uh, about a year ago. Last, you know, really all grain batch. I've been doing a lot of extract batches lately, just because of time. But um, it took me four hours to lauder. Wow! <laughs> it, with it was a, it was a, I guess a, yeah, it's just a five gallon recipe. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was a ten gallon recipe. That's right. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, it was a ten gallon recipe. And uh, I had I had tried uh, to make sure that I got great efficiency by uh, double milling a portion of the grain. And I was using the multi-pipe manifold, you know, proven system in my got cooler with good temperature control. But uh, that mash just did not want to lauder. <laughs> it would just trickled out over four hours. I had I had. I, my OG was high. I mean, I really got great efficiency. It just took forever. <laughs> so it's like, okay, next time, don't grind it again. <laughs> just leave it alone. <laughs> yeah, there, there's there's such a thing as as uh, the mash ton efficiency, and then there's the time efficiency in uh, in brewing. You know, how much is your time? How many gravity points is your time worth as well? So that's right. That's right. <laughs> But uh, I'm, I'm building a rim system now, or I'm going to use a false bottom in that uh, with you know in a Sankey keg. Wow! So and that'll 
this would be my dream system. <laughs> and hopefully it'll work. Well, it's, this has been fun. I, I appreciate your taking time out to uh, to talk with us again. Oh, my pleasure. It's, it's always good to be on your show. And uh, hopefully I uh, hopefully once again I've said things clearly. I know I've when I go back and listen to the shows afterwards, like, ooh, I should have said that better. <laughs> but uh, you know. well, I, I've always got your email address to forward the questions to. If uh, if not, so <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. Well, thanks, John. You're welcome. Well, thanks again to John for coming on the show. It's always good to talk to him. Be sure to pick up John's book, How to Brew. It's an excellent resource. And you can visit howtobrew.com to read an earlier version of that text. But uh, you really need to get the latest. Really. And uh, also look for John's book uh, that he wrote along with Jamil Zanishaf called Brewing Classic Styles, 80 Winning Recipes Anyone Can Brew. If you have uh, brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And uh, remember, our 2008 Brewers Logbooks are still out there. We still have a few. Check them out on our site. And uh, check out the new low-tech lagering and decoction mashing DVD where you can see Steve Wilkes do a single-step decoction mash and you can follow me through a lager fermentation in the middle of summer, which seems so long ago, uh, where I don't use a dedicated chest freezer. There are also our original DVDs in uh, Basic Brewing, Introduction to Extract Home Brewing. We walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step step, from boiling to bottling. And in Basic Brewing, Stepping into All Grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. And we talk about batch sparging and fly sparging as well in there, so you can see those methods demonstrated. We've got new combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. And uh, you can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it online in our new and improved online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Remember, shirts and hats are out there, too, including our Go Forth and Flocculate shirt. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are four replacement tail props for mini infrared remote control electric helicopters and Sill Blade 119 silicone wiper blade, pack of one. Thanks, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We appreciate your support. Well, that's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson, our buddy in Austin, who also designed our logo. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. So long.